Hi, morning everyone. Welcome to episode 46 of the Knitting Expat podcast. My name is Mina and I am here with you today for another episode, another week, another podcast. Um, thank you for joining me. If it's your first time, thank you for taking the time to check me out. And if you're a returning viewer, thank you so much for coming back. Um, yeah, so... Today is Wednesday the 27th of January 2016. My name is Mina, I'm not sure if I've already said that. I am coming to you from my home in Bahrain where I live with my husband and our two cats. Um, yeah, if you are new to the podcast and uh, this is your first time checking me out, like I said, thank you. And um, I did a bit of a reintroduction a couple of episodes back, I think it was the first one for this year. I did a bit of a reintroduction of um, where we are and what we're doing here and stuff like that. Um, I just also wanted to say, you. Um, sorry, I'm not quite with it this morning yet. Perry, uh, my husband, um, dragged me out the house this morning at 7am because um, he's in Riyadh in Saudi Arabia for a couple of days and I had to take him to the airport this morning. So uh, I woke up really early for me to take him to the airport and um, I'm still not functioning at 100%. So, um, so yeah, you can find me online. That's what I was trying to say. You can find me online as Mina86 on Ravelry. We have a podcast group on Ravelry and that's the Knitting Expat podcast. You can find me on Instagram as Mina Philip, and... Uh, I sell project bags on Etsy as Mina Makes, but the shop's closed at the moment. And you can find show notes for the podcast for this episode and all previous episodes at the Knitting Expat. Um, the, sorry, not the, sorry, it's just knittingexpat.wordpress.com. Like I said, not quite with it this morning. Um, you can find links to everything that I've just mentioned below the video on YouTube in the description box on the episode thread in the Ravelry group and on the blog, so in the show notes. So wherever this video is embedded, which it's embedded in all three of those places, where you can, then um, you should be able to find links to where, everywhere else that you can find me. Um, what else was I going to say? Oh, yes. So last week I mentioned that I'd, uh, it was only like the day before I recorded last week's episode, that I realised the preview, previous week's podcast notes, the show notes, hadn't been published. I'd written them up and they were all ready to go, but I'd, I'd, I'd just hit save instead of publish and didn't realise. And no one told me, so no one mentioned it or anything. So I was wondering if anyone actually used the show notes. And so many of you have gone in touch since then, either by a private message on Instagram, um, in, the, in the comments in the episode thread, and... Um, on YouTube, we've left comments to say, yeah, that you do use the show notes and you find them really useful. And most of you just assume that because I was traveling, I didn't have time. So first of all, thank you so much <laughs> for everyone um, for letting me know. Second of all, thank you for being so kind as to think that I was uh, too busy to do them. Um, and third of all, I will continue to do them. No need to worry about that. Uh, all I would say is if I don't mention in the podcast that they're going to be late or that they're not going to be up or something and they're not up, then just give me a little nudge because almost, you know, they, I always do the show notes as the episode is uploading to YouTube. So that's kind of what I use that time for. And um, yeah, they're always ready when the podcast is ready to go live. So if they're not up and I haven't said anything about it, someone just please give me a nudge and I'll make sure they go up because it, it might just be that I've hit save instead of publish again. <laughs> um, also I wanted to say I hope everyone who's been going through that massive snowstorm in the northeast um, coastal area of the US is uh, doing okay. I saw a lot of really snowy looking pictures on Instagram this last week and I have to say I've been slightly gutted that we missed it by so, such a short amount of time. We were there the weekend before and then this weekend that's just gone uh, was the snow I, yeah so I was a little bit gutted that we missed the big snowstorm but Perry was like oh well, if, you know we wouldn't have made, we might have not been able to make it back I'm like but snow I don't get to see snow very often so I guess for a lot of you it's you have it every year so it's not that big a deal but when you live in a desert snow's a big deal <laughs> Um, 
Yeah, and the only other bit of news to give before we get started properly is that I've got a new pattern out on Ravelry now, and that's the Highland Peaks shawl design, and you can see I'm wearing the fingering weight version at the moment, and the worsted weight version is the one on the wall hanging behind me. I realised last week I wasn't very good at actually remembering to tell you what I'm wearing, um, I seem to be quite bad at that. Um, but yes, yes, I'm wearing the Highland Peaks shawl and once I get to the end of this row I will show it to you. <laughs> so the one hanging behind me, like I said, is the worst of weight version. I pretty much lived in that shawl the whole week that we were in New York when it was cold and windy. That thing was amazing. It's soft, it's squishy. I made it out of um, Malabrigo worsted, which is actually more like an Aran weight. It's a single ply superwash merino yarn. It is so soft and squishy and it's just lovely. It's just the perfect thing to wrap up in when it's cold. I never would have thought that having a worsted weight shawl was going to be useful. And then I knit it up and I was just like, oh, well, this is what was missing in my life. Um, so yes, yeah, so this is the, the fingering weight version. And for the fingering weight version, you only need three 50 gram balls. So it's, um, it's cost effective in that way if you're buying yarn that comes in 50 grams. Sorry about that, I got the attack of the sneeze, <laughs> the sneezes. Um, so like I was saying, it comes in, th it's, it only uses three 50 gram balls of yarn, fingering weight um, to knit. So you only need about 600 meters. You could knit it out of um, two colors. So you could use one color for um, one 50 gram color just for the contrasting stripes and then one 100 gram skein for the other stripe and the border and you could do this stri one stripe and the border in the same color so in this case the cream would remain as the contrast and then you could do the the, the other stripe and the border in either purple or green or whatever color you choose i would recommend um you can go for like bright colors you can go for variegated but if you want to contrast um if you want a high contrast i would so just go for a contrasting, high contrasting yarn. It'll be good for tonals. It'll be good for all sorts. I saw this morning on Instagram, actually, there's one person who's started theirs and they're knitting it out of a gradient. So they're doing it all in one. They're not doing the stripes. They're just knitting it all solid, but in a gradient. And that's going to look beautiful. I've just seen the beginning. They've only just started it and I can't wait to see how that one's going to turn out. So yeah, so if you are knitting it, um, please uh, hashtag it on Instagram with Highland Peaks Shawl. And you can tag me as well on there. I'd love to see you guys, uh, see what you guys, see your guys' progress <laughs> of, on the shawl. And uh, yes, so like I said, it's now available on Ravelry. They are two individual patterns for the different sizes. I was going through, as I was writing it up, um, sorry, my coffee. Um, as I was writing it up, I realized, and as I was knitting the worst weight version, because um, I knit this one first, wrote it up and then knit this, the worst weight version off the fingering weight pattern and making the adjustments where I needed to. Um, that's just how I do it. <laughs> and uh, I realized that some of the changes were significant enough that to merge them onto the same pattern would make it, could make it confusing for someone who's a beginner. And that was the whole point of this design. This design is meant to be incredibly easy for a beginner to knit. And it is, it's very simple. Um, there are increases, but the way the increases are done, you're not increasing every row or every other row even. Um, it's quite intuitive, I found, and most of my testers have found it to be quite intuitive. And the lace is very simple. It's very easy to see if you make a mistake because the eyelets all line up. You get this sort of um, chevrony peaks pattern that you can sort of see. It's all done in garter stitch. So there's no purling. It's like I said, very simple for a beginner. and But again, like I mentioned, there's enough differences between the two versions that I felt it warranted having it two separate patterns to keep it less confusing. So you can buy them individually or together for a discount um, as an ebook. I just found that's the easiest way to do it on Ravelry. So um, the two together, $6. Um, individually, they're four fifty. So, yeah. Anyway. So let's move on, <laughs> enough rambling. Um, right, so some podcasts that I wanted to mention this week. Um, I have a few to mention. So the first one is the Oloops, um, Oloops Ladies. 
that's their Fibre by Design podcast. Oloops is their uh, yarn dyeing business that they do. And that's Sarah and Lydia. And they they are just so sweet. I really love watching their podcast. And I think it was last week they they mentioned my podcast, which was so lovely to hear. And I was so excited to hear that. And they are there's some really lovely things to say. And thank so just thank you so much, ladies. I really um really enjoy catching up with you guys whenever you record. They are starting to record more regularly now, which is great. And they've uh, come up with a new format for their podcast as of the new year. So that's also been really fun. Um, I, I'm kind of liking the new format, which is which is great. And I'm really excited to see um, what they come up with this year because they come up with some really beautiful colorways. And I've always been really tempted to get some, but for, unfortunately for me, a lot of the time international postage just means ordering stuff from the US isn't really possible. Sometimes I can justify it if there's a sale on or something, but um, more often than not, I can't. So I just, I just oogle, I just oogle from a distance and like uh, longingly wish for it. But it's, uh, it's really, they, they come up with some really lovely yarns. So if you ever have a chance to get your hands on some, I would definitely, definitely go for it. Um, the other one is, the next one, sorry, on my list, is the Charm of It podcast with Eva. And she's also based in the US. She's really softly spoken, very sweet. And I really like her projects and her philosophy with knitting. It's uh, very different to mine, but equally um, just just great. And I really like her sense of style and her aesthetic. She is a very um, self-aware in terms of what suits her and what colors suit her. And she sort of sticks with that color scheme. Um, but she also likes to challenge herself, which I think is really interesting. I think at the moment she's starting to design a sweater for herself, which is going to be cabled and all sorts. And I think that's really exciting. I'm looking forward to seeing how that develops. Um, the next podcast I wanted to mention was the He Loco podcast, and that's with Nicole. I've been wanting to mention Nicole's podcast for a few weeks now. I just never got around to it for some reason. Um, again, another podcast that I really enjoy listening to. She's very, again, quite softly spoken. Sorry, that's Hugo. Um, and, and yeah, I just really enjoy her episodes. She always has something new to share. Um, she she has a yarn dyeing business. She makes and sells project bags. She does, she does all sorts. She's a mum of three little boys. And she gets so much done each week. Honestly, it's amazing how much she can get done. Um, and she's also done several tutorials. Some yarn dyeing tutorials, some sewing tutorials. For those of you, there have been a few people who've previously in the past gotten in touch with me about um, how to make project bags and stuff. She's a project bag tutorial um, and she's a very good teacher. I am self-confessed, I am not a good teacher. I have tried teaching people in the past. I've, you know, to relative degrees of success, but it's always been very frustrating for me. I am not naturally a good teacher. Um, so I'm always very impressed by people who have the patience to teach because that is one thing that I lack in life is patience. So if you want a good teacher for sewing projects and yarn dyeing, make sure you check out her podcast and her tutorials. And the last one I wanted to mention is a brand new podcast and it's called Threaded with Fibre. And that is with Jane. She She's so lovely, so sweet. I really loved her podcast. She's she did some very interesting things with her knitting, I have to say. And she, she was actually one of my test knitters for the Highlands Peak Shawl. And I saw on Instagram that she started a podcast, so I went and checked her out. And she knitted the Stephen West Shawl, the Doodler. But then she re-knit it using a much drapier, I think it was a cotton viscous yarn. So a cotton bamboo blend. And uh, she'd... She did another one, but she only did clue one and two. So she only did like the wing, like the butterfly wing section and then the cable across the top. But again, she didn't, she did the cable all the same width, she didn't do it wider. And then she just stopped there. And she'd added, she added a buttonhole somewhere and added a toggle and basically wore it like a cape. And it looked amazing. I thought it was such an ingenious like alteration to make to the pattern because everyone says how much they love clue one and two and most people did not like clue three, the last section of the shawl. Um, and they found those rows really annoying. And I am a knitter. I'm, I'm purely basing all this on what I've heard other people say about the pattern. 
but the version that Jane did, I thought that was amazing. And if I ever knit the doodler, I would probably do something similar to what Jane did. So make sure you go and check her out if you want to see how that turned out, because it's awesome. And yeah, I think that pretty, co pretty much covers it for uh, podcasts this week that I wanted to talk about. And again, once I get to the end of this row, we can get on to finished objects, which you can see a stack of them right here next to me. Uh, right, let's get going. Put that down. Sock block is ready. Again, I have a stack of socks for you guys this week. Stack of socks. Um, yeah, another very productive sock knitting week, I have to say. So, starting off with this pair. So, it's going to be a bit of clanging around. I am so sorry if that was loud. I'll try not to do that again. Because that was loud for me and I sat right here. Okay. Apologies. Lots of socks, lots of blockers. Um, is this pair? So this is the first up. This is uh, the Pants Croy FX in cameo colours. And yeah, that's how these knit up. They are, I know these colours are, they don't really have repeats and stuff, but the two balls were really quite different. I'm not sure how I feel about that. But anyway, so that's pair number... I can't remember what number we're at now. Uh, one second. 19. Yes, pair number 19. And then pair 20. You know what, I think I'm just going to do one sock. Because otherwise this is going to take forever. Okay, so pair number 20 was the Pants Croy Stripes in Grey Brown Marl. And that's how that one's turned out. And all of these are knit using my Mina's Two at a Time uh, sock pattern, which is free download on Ravelry, with fish lips kiss heel, 2x2 two two rib, and my rounded toe. Then, that was number 20. Pair 21. Is Knit Picks Felici in the Mosaic colorway. And this is the other sock. Again, similar sort of thing, two by two rib, fish lips kiss heel, rounded toe. The only thing I have to say about the Knit Picks Felici that hasn't, that doesn't, that I don't like so much, is like, can you see some of these stripes are quite, they've got, they're a bit muddied with the other colors. It's not so bad on that one. You can see quite a bit when you're knitting it as well. But it's not too bad. I mean, you can see there, and a bit there. So that's pair number 21. Then pair number 22 was actually a bit of a mismatched pair. I say a bit, it's very mismatched. So this is Pants Croy um, in, sorry, I keep cutting my head off. I don't know why I'm doing that. This is Pants Croy in coal, basically black. And this one is Pants Croy in celestial. So this is what I'm calling my night sky in black hole. Celestial refers to like astrological bodies and stuff. So night sky, black hole. <laughs> but for this, this and the next two or three pairs of socks, I tried something different with my socks and you can probably see it better on the next pair than this one. But the one thing I hear everyone saying about the fish dips kiss heel, other than the fact that um, it doesn't have a gusset, so you don't have the added stitches there, is that the, um, the heel flap method, you have the reinforced heel section, so that makes it longer wearing because it makes that section thicker, so it doesn't wear through as quickly. So I was like, what's to say that you can't have a heel flap effect, as it were, on a fish lips kiss heel? So about 20 rows before I started doing the fish lips kiss heel, I started doing a slip stitch on the back half of the stitches. So basically it's like a faux heel flap. Um, and then I carried on in the slip stitch pattern for the fish lips kiss heel. And I did the fish lips kiss heel in the slip stitch and then I did it for a further 10 rows 
just on the heel side um, to give a faux, faux heel flap look, I guess. And actually having the slip stitches on the heel itself, I'm wondering if that's going to make an, uh, have an impact on the longevity or on the wear of the socks. I haven't worn any of these yet. I mean, I put them on my feet and they feel fine. Like I don't really feel the stitches any differently. So, but in terms of how they wear, I'm not entirely sure. Um, so yeah, like I said, you'll probably see them better on this pair and I'll put both of these on the blockers so you can see clearly what I mean. Um, sorry. This is pair number 19, 20, 23. I'm losing track now. This is terrible. So this is pair number 23. And this yarn is um, Yarn Enabler in the Rubber Ducky colorway. So you can see the slip stitch heel here much clearer. Let me put this one down. You can see it on this side nicely. So 20 rows before I started the heel, I did the slip stitches on the back half of the back half of the foot. I did the slip stitch for the actual flip, fish lips kiss heel and for 10 rows after. And I quite like it how on this side you can see it better here. The slip stitch section almost looks a bit like colour work, the way it's worked out. Doing the slip stitches does mean it changes the um the gauge a little bit. Oh, sorry, I keep cutting my head off. It does change the gauge a little bit over the front of the foot as well. But um, I did find, I tried these on as well, and they fit really well. They are ever so slightly tight over the over the instep. But I think if, um, but that's obviously just to do with the slip stitches. So I think just a couple more stitches added into this section when I do it next time would fix that. But otherwise, it fits really well through this section here. And my biggest issue, the reason why I started doing this, or try playing around with this, was because I was worried not worried, but one of the issues I have with my socks is over time they stretch out. They stretch out and they they don't then sit on my foot very well. I mean, they're fine, they're perfectly wearable and I wear all my socks. And it doesn't matter whether the socks have a heel flap or if it's a fish lips kids heel, once they stretch out, then they um, the heel starts to slide under my foot when I'm walking. Um, and like I said, it doesn't matter, heel flap or fish lips kiss heel, both I have the same problem with. So I thought if I made the heel a little bit tighter, then maybe that would help negate that problem. Uh, I think we're on pair 25 now. 19. Sorry, this is pair 25. The first pair I showed you was pair 20. and. Uh, I've lost count. Like, I'll tell you what the final tally is at the end. <laughs> that might be easier. So this is the next pair. Was Knit Picks um, Stroll hand painted um, in the Northern Lights colorway. That's this one. This one is. I only did the slip stitch on the twenty rows before the fish lips kiss heel, but then I did the fish lips kiss heel in stockinette to see what a difference that would make. Um, this also fits really well because again, I find my socks, the baggiest part of my socks on my foot when I wear them first is always around this section, just above the, just above the ankle or just at the ankle. Um, so this tightens that up nicely and so it sits more snugly. And I also wanted to see what difference this would make without the heel, without the actual fish lips kiss heel being in slip stitch as well. And to be honest, by the time I got to this pair of socks, this was, I had four socks on the needle, five socks on the needles at the same time. I did, was it five? Yeah, five socks on the needles at the same time. And I'd done four sets of heels already, all with the fish lips kiss heel in slip stitch. By the time I got to this one, my hands, we're just like, no, we can't do this anymore. So I just stuck with the regular normal stocking app version on this one. So that's pair number 25. Pair number 26 is, again, Knit Picks. Uh, this is Stroll Tonal in Poppy Field. So this is lovely yellow, sunshine yellow colorway. And this one again has the slip stitch, fish lips kiss heel all the way through and this again fits really nicely and 
this pair is definitely going to be for my mum. So yeah. And the final pair is pair number 27. And these are the rainbow Felici socks. And these also have the slip stitch heel section. So yeah, like I said, I, this week I was playing around with the uh, slip stitch heel see what sort of effect that would give me and I quite like it actually I think I probably will do this more in the future on my socks and see how they wear and I'll report back on that one um let me just move these blockers out of the way sorry so that's another bunch of socks to add to the pile which if you hadn't already noticed I'd started filling in that cubby hole there with all the socks from this month because why not Kristen from uh, uh, Vine Young Gasm podcast is hosting a box of socks cow for 2016 and her her minimum requirement is 12 pairs of socks in the year <sighs> I'm going to have to find a box big enough to fit all these socks. Uh, Kristen, how about a cubby? Cubby of socks. <laughs> um, so yeah, so these are going to go into that cubby once I'm done filming. And yeah, I'm trying to think if there was anything else I wanted to tell you about these socks before I moved on. Nope, I think that's it. Right, sorry, back again. I decided to actually just go add them to the cubby now so you can see them all stacked up there in the background. So there's now 27 socks in that cubby. And today is Wednesday, 27th of January. So keeping up with my uh, tally there. So I finished all of those on Monday, Monday evening. So I had to pick out more socks to cast on. I have to say though, I am definitely definitely ready for something new. I am getting not border socks. I still want to knit socks, which is probably sounds crazy to most of you people uh, at this point. I'm not bored of socks. I am just bored of not being able to do anything else but socks. I have a to-do list that is growing every day because I just can't do anything else other than knit socks right now. I have so many admin things I need to get started with. My, I am just dying to cast on more design projects right now it is yeah anyway i'll talk more about that later work moving on to works in progress i have more socks to show you surprise surprise i bet you guys are bored of seeing socks now as well um all right so i'll start with the one that i was knitting on earlier that you saw and so this is this is yarn by dag who is a uh, paper dag on Instagram and she has the Etsy shop Zia Wools. Zia Wools, I think it's an Etsy shop. And she actually sent me this yarn, which I showed you last week in the skein. And I couldn't pronounce the name of it, but I've learned since it is called uh, Pumuckles, Pumuckles Party. And I believe Pumuckle is a German uh, children's cartoon character. I looked it up online and someone told me. And so yeah, so she sent me this as um, as a skein of her yard to try out and for for the soccer thon. So thank you so much for that, Dag. Love this yarn. I love this base. This is her Scania base. Let me just find the tag. So that's the company Zia Wools with a Z. And the Scania base, Sandia, it's not Scania, sorry, Sandia base. Sandia base is fine fingering sock weight, 75-25 superwash merino nylon, um, four ounces or about 113 grams is 434 yards, 397 meters. And this skein was actually quite heavy. Uh, Dag was very generous with her skein. It's 125 grams the skein, so definitely, definitely enough for a pair of socks. And I don't actually use that much in a pair of socks anyway. I really love how these are knitting up. I have these on high, sh high, high shops at the moment. I love the stitch definition on these socks, on this yarn. It just knits up beautifully. I love it. Mm, thank you so much for sending it, Dag. And I love these colors. 
as you can probably tell. Um, and they match my raccoon bag perfectly. <laughs> so that's the first uh, work in progress. I, that was on 2.25 millimeter needles. Sorry, I realized I didn't actually tell you what needles I use for all the other socks I showed you in finished objects. Everything is in the show notes in terms of what needle sizes I've used. Um, because otherwise I just feel like I'm gonna keep saying the same thing again and again. Next up I have in the floral dots bag is a pair of Pants Croy socks. This is Pants Cro Pant Croy stripes and this is the Sweet Stripes colorway. I picked this up in the US when we were there recently. I'm really glad actually I picked up so much Pants Croy when we were over there because I've ended up knitting most of that already, <laughs> surprisingly, or maybe not surprisingly. Um, because yeah, it's already in the two skeins and it's quick and easy to get started on that. Um, and so that's how these are knitting up at the moment. I am not 100% um, happy with this yarn. It's fine, Pants Croy yarn is fine. It's not actually the yarn itself, it's more about the dye job. Um, two things. I went through the effort of making sure they started off at the same place, and they do. They start off and they're perfectly matching, and the colour changes were within were within um, a quarter of a round, so they were like half of one side different from each other when the colours changed. Right up until I got to the yellow, and as you can see from the yellow onwards, the stripes really don't line up that well, and they're now more than one round different between when the colours change. So when the green started, you see here, I'm already, I'm already two rounds into the green on this sock and this one is still on the white. Sorry, this one's already moved on to white. What am I talking about? Sorry. This round, this sock, is two, ro two rounds ahead of this sock. So this has only got two rows of green and this one's got three rows of green and one row of white. So this one's two rows behind in the colour changes. So that's one, which is a bit annoying because they were perfectly matching up until then. There's no knots or anything. Second thing, I don't know how well this is picking up on camera or if you can even tell, but the purple stripes, the darker purple stripes in this, in the left one on the screen, I think it's still the left when you see it, or on this one, is darker than the purple in this. I'm not sure how well that's coming across. I think you can sort of tell. But in person, it's really obvious that one purple is darker than the other. So that's a bit annoying, but not the end of the world. These aren't socks for me. These are very much not my colours. They're very, a bit too pastel for me. And so these will probably be for a gift. So we will see. So yeah, that'd be my only thing. I had a lot of people commenting on Instagram when I showed this yarn saying how much they really liked it and they were asking about it. My only... Um, Word of caution would be make sure that the colours are matching when you buy them because if you buy it because the two skeins don't match as well as I thought they did. Right, that's on 2.75 millimeter needles, which is a US two. Um, right, next up. This is another pair of socks, of course. I don't even know why I bother saying that. And this is on the yarn is spun right round. This is her snappy sock base, which is 75% Corydell, 75% superwash Corydell, 25% nylon, 434 yards in 100 grams. This is actually was 115 gram skein, so again, very um, very generous yardage. And this is in the graffiti overlay colorway. And I really liked how this was speckled and how it looked in the how it looked in the skein. And when it arrived, I mean on on screen as well. And when it arrived, I realized it was probably a lot more pink than I was anticipating. I wasn't really expecting it to be quite so pink, I guess. And this is what it looks like in the cake. And I was kind of hoping that as it knit up, this is the other cake. That as it knit up, the pink would be muted a little bit with the other colours, but it seems to be, no, it is going to be very pink. <laughs> so these will definitely be gift socks. These are not going to be for me. Um, definitely too pink for me. But I am enjoying knitting it. I am enjoying all the different colours as they come up. 
it's it's really fun i really especially like this section this whole bit here on the cuff with all the different colors coming through and i just think it's a bit of it, it's very fun to knit this and, and i am enjoying it and these are on 2.5 millimeters also high high sharps the pants croy socks are on chai goose and yeah and that's that and the last pair of socks i have on the needles at the moment is uh are these ones and these are uh wool bearers yarn in the woolly bear sock woolly bears sock yarn it's 80 percent superwash merino 20 percent nylon and that's uh 100 grams 420 yards it's pretty, it's pretty standard for sock yarn and again i'm really loving how these are knitting up really really lovely i picked this this yarn up at vogue knitting live so this is actually my first purchase from vogue knitting live itself that i'm knitting with and i really love how these are knitting up i love the purples and the greens and there's actually some really subtle shades of both colors that run throughout in the cream section so the the, new, the, the natural colored section isn't all natural colors there's there's lots of variation in that um that probably not being picked up on camera. What I really like though is how on the back of one of the socks there is like one stitch that's come up in this sort of two stitches, one and a half stitches that have come up in this really bright pop of fuchsia that you know sort of stands out <laughs> on the sock rather randomly which I thought was quite fun and we'll see if that pops up again anywhere else in the skein or it might have just been a random drop of dye that got into the wrong pot so yeah so that's another four uh socks which brings up if i get those finished brings my total up to 31 so that's one pair of socks for each day of the month so far and we'll see when those get done because i can't i started all of those yesterday um and they're doing pretty well <laughs> they're doing pretty well uh, this this pair is the closest this one's uh, like five rows away from starting the heel and the others are about 20 to 30 rows away from starting the heels so it's going well i think i'm doing okay my my aim for the day is to get them all past the heel get the heels put into all of them i probably won't do the slip stitch heels on these ones because it does take more time it does it did slow me down with the other pairs of socks that i did and it does hurt my hands more um, especially doing it repeatedly so I think in future when I'm knitting one or two pairs of socks at a time um, doing the slip stitch heel is going to be fine it's not going to aggravate me as much but doing it back to back on four pairs of socks is a bit much um, and I don't want to hurt myself so <laughs> I'm not going to be doing that um, yeah I think that's it for works in progress so I think I'm going to stop the video here really quickly and reorganize myself and I will be back. Right, okay, back again. Sorry about that. Um, right, so cows and giveaways. So for cow news, we currently have the Vida cow that's running in the group and that is running until the end of January. So if you are working on any of the Vida patterns, that's the hat, shawl or socks, then please pop on over to the group and enter your finished objects into the into the thread. There's only one thread for chatter and finished objects. And if you don't have a finished object, still enter away because there are chatter prices as well. And rules and everything for that are in the thread. Then the other cow that we have going on at the moment is the January Sockathon cow, which if you hadn't gathered is for socks. Uh, if you are new to the podcast and you're not aware of the Sockathon, it is a challenge between myself and Marsha of the Fairy Little Twitch and Stitch podcast. She challenged me um, around October last year to a sock competition to see who can knit the most pairs of socks in the month in a month. And originally we were going to do it back then, but then with I had a, you know I had a lot of traveling coming up and Christmas and everything, we thought we'd put it off and do it in January. So that's how it became the January Sockathon, and um, so that's why I'm knitting socks like a crazy person. And yeah, so there are prizes for that. Uh, the Sockathon isn't really, it's a competition between the two of us, but we thought we'd open it up as a general this long for everyone else. So if you're entering, um, so if you're knitting socks this month, come along and enter it into the finished objects thread, join the chatter. Um, there will be prizes. I showed prizes a few episodes back and I will be drawing for prizes um, 
at the beginning of February and I will announce them on the next on next week's podcast. So really quickly, there's a skein of yarn, there's two skeins of yarn and a set of mini skeins. So what I'm doing is I'm putting together a set of mini skeins with minis with a mini from each of the socks that I've knit this month. So it's going to be quite a sizable package of minis it seems. So far you're going to have it looks like you're going to have over 30 mini skeins in that price package. So I think that's going to be one of the grand prizes. Um and if I can, I may see if I can get two sets of minis for every for two prizes with that. We'll see. I'm not sure. Some of the patterns croy yarn. I don't know if I have enough to make two minis. Um, because I want to keep a mini set for myself. So we will see. Um so yeah, sorry. So that's the January Soccathon. Then we also have the sweater knit along that's going on. That's a year-long cowl in our group for knitting sweaters, cardigans hoodies, shirts, t-shirts, anything that's a garment, anything that you wear that is not a shawl or an accessory. So if you're knitting anything like that, come into the group. It's a very sort of, um, it's a very chatty thread at the moment, which is great. People helping out, people asking questions and needing, you know, getting help and stuff. So make sure you come on over. I am also popping in and out of that thread. I have been very um, inactive on Ravelry in terms of comments on the on the threads. I know I am about two weeks behind on replying to comments in the episode threads. So for the last two episodes, I haven't really replied to comments and I will reply to comments. I'm just, it's not that I ha I've read them all. I'm sorry for not getting back to you sooner. Like I said, I've read everything. I just have not had enough time to put the needles down long enough to be able to do it, to reply. I mean, my Highland Peaks shawl was ready to be published. I just hadn't put the time aside to sit down and upload it to Ravelry and do all the stuff you need to do to publish a pattern. Um, so that went up a week later than I'd intended. But I will get there. I will catch up. And if I if I don't do it this week, then next week I will be getting back to everybody. I'm going to be spending a whole day just doing admin. And I will talk more about that later too. Um, and... A new cal that's going to be starting on the 1st of February, so I, this is the last podcast of the month, so it's why I'm bringing this up now, is going to be the Knitting Expat Shawl Cal. So it's, the hashtag will be KE Shawl Cal, um, and that'll be starting 1st of Feb, running until the 31st of March. Uh, any shawl you want to knit or crochet can be entered, scarves, wraps, etc., anything that goes around the neck effectively um, can can count, whips can count as long as you have a decent amount of work left on it, you know, as long as it's not just a bind off, you know, just be a bit reasonable um, in that regard. I'm not going to be super strict about it, but at the same time, if you only have like a bind off left to go, please don't enter it because I don't think that's really fair on everyone else. Um, there is one entry per finished object, as per my standard usual cow rules. But uh, the only new thing I am adding to this one is if you knit any of any of my designs, any of my shawl patterns, then you can enter your finished object twice in the finished objects thread. It's my cal, it's my rules. I can do what I want. <laughs> but yeah, because uh, I've released a couple of shawl patterns recently, there's the Across the Pond and the Highland Peaks, and I haven't done specific knit-alongs for those shawl patterns. So this is basically your opportunity. If you are knitting one of the shawls, um, any of my shawls really, uh, please come and join the cow. That'll be a lot of fun. And I already have some prizes set aside for this knit along. I have one in particular, which I've been sort of accumulating things for over the last few, um, last few months that I've, I've had in mind very specifically for this cow. So that'll be exciting. I'll show you all of that next week as well. And if you are a maker or of any kind, fibre related, if you're a bag maker, yarn dyer, stitch market maker, whatever, and um, you'd be interested in donating a prize for this niche along, then please do get in touch. I'd love to hear from you and um, we can arrange something to make that work. And, and yeah, so I think that is it for the niche along news. And we'll move on to questions and answers. I just got a couple of things I wanted to say quickly before we get into the uh, new questions this week is um, I just want to say a thank you to everyone who answered last week's question about using superwash yarns for so non superwash yarns for socks. I was sent a link to a blog post about this topic by the lovely Tilly Trout 
of the Tilly Trout podcast. And she, um, that's very interesting, actually. I was reading it the other day. It's a very interesting read. So I will link that in the show notes and on the episode thread. And if I forget to link it, please remind me so I make sure to link it. Um, I have the page open, so I shouldn't forget. Um, And then a couple of people had asked me about the little sheep that I'd received from Amber uh, last week, where those came from. And at the time, I wasn't 100% sure, but since I have gone and I have found out. So what I'm talking about, the little, the sheep stash, the little wooden cutout sheep, these guys. Um, And they come from Juniper Moon Sheep Shop on Etsy. The shop is actually closed at the moment. They've uh, been closed for a while. I think they're taking a break after the Christmas period. Um... And also, Susan B. Anderson designed a a set of sweater patterns for the sheep, um, which are available for free on her blog. So I will link both the Etsy shop and Susan B. Anderson's blog um, so you can see those. You can find them there. You can find where they are, basically. Uh, I don't know when the shop is opening. I don't know if they're going to be selling the sheep anymore. Um, But I'll give you the links to them. So, moving on to the new questions this week. First question we got, I got was from Sonia and she says, Hi Mina, love the show, thank you. Um, I have a question about the fish tips kiss heel and I know you are doing lots of them. When I get to the part where I'm done with the heel and joining all stitches back in the round, I seem to have very loose stitches that look like a hole but they are just loose. Any tips or tricks to remedy this? Okay, so I talked a couple of weeks ago about how I was given a tip on how to close the gap between stitches when you're joining back in the round by picking up the bar, twisting it and putting it back on the stitch, on the needle and knitting it together with the next stitch. Um, That actually I find helps tighten up because that bar is what links those two, you know, links the stitch on one needle on on the front and back of that side of the sock. Um, so that that helps to tighten it up a little bit. Also, when you come to the when you're actually doing the fish tips kiss heel, and you come to do the twin stitch in the first and last stitch on the heel side, and if you're doing the fish tips kiss heel and you have the pattern, I think you'll know what I mean by that. Um, you really need to pull tight. You really need to pull tight on that stitch because that's the one that um, if you don't pull tight on that one, that's when you get the loosey goosey stitches on the on the corners and to be honest I sometimes get them I'm not immune to the loose stitches at the corners um I just try to tighten it up as best I can um I haven't found a particular way to make sure it doesn't happen um like I said I do find when you join back in the round if you pick up the bar between the front and back needles so say for example I've just done the fish lips kiss heel and this is the heel side, this is the front. When I'm getting ready to start knitting on this side, I pick up this bar, twist it, pop it back onto this the front needle. And when I go to knit the first stitch, I knit the twist, the stitch I picked up and the first stitch together. And that helps tighten up that hole. Or it'll also help tighten up the stitch because you're pulling some of that excess yarn out into that stitch. I hope that made sense. Um, then the next question I have is from Tricotage on Ravelry and um, for a name Ravelry only shows that up as saying B. So B, you, uh, your question was, you mentioned several different knitting needles you have used and I was wondering with all the sock knitting that you do, what personal criteria do you use for deciding which needle you will work with besides your go-to ones? Okay, well needle size obviously will be the first one, depending what needle size I want to use for the socks. Um, for 2.75 US2, I only have one pair of needles for that, which is my chai goos, so I don't really have much choice with that one, but I do like the chai goos, so not a problem. Um, I do find though with the chai goos, you have to be careful with laddering because the cord is the least flexible, as it were. I do like the cord, I do like the fact that it has no memory, but the fact that it doesn't have... Um, as much flexibility as say high hires or the addies it does um it can cause laddering if you're not careful but to be quite honest ladders don't really bother me all that much um i do try and avoid them as best i can but if they happen they happen i don't kick myself over it i don't you know i don't 
I, won't, I wouldn't rip out a project over it, let's put it that way. Um, otherwise, I really like the High High Sharps, really, really like them. They are probably by far my favourites at the moment. But for very splitty yarn, both for yarn that's prone to splitting, I do like the Addies. The Addy Turbo Sock Rockets, I picked up my first pair of Sock Rockets on this recent trip to New York. I had a pair of Addy Lace Needles. I'm not very impressed with the Addy Lace Needles, and I'll explain why in a future episode. I'm trying to see if I can find them nearby if I have... Yeah. And I don't know how well you are going to be able to see. I don't think you can see. But can you see there? The silver, the, the coating has rubbed off and you can see the gold, like the brass or whatever the, the main metal is in there has come through. And this section of the needle now, this whole bit here and this side, a bit, you know, close to where the join is to the cable to the cord is so sticky now because that smooth coating is rubbed off and some of the you know that the nickel coating the nickel plate has rubbed off and it's super snaggy now and it's not um I mean it's not snaggy sorry it's just super sticky and sometimes it becomes quite hard to move the stitches along and it's frustrating it's not the end of the world I've knit plenty of socks on those needles this month and they've been fine it's just not been my favourite to work with in terms of feel. And I also recently got a pair of the Carbons, which I am liking, but they're not as fast for me as the High Highs or the Addy Turbos um, or the Trigoos. So I, I I think I just need to practice with them more. I need to, I've knit two pairs of socks with them now, and they're good. They give me good stitches. I like how they knit. They're not too slippery. Um, I just don't think I'm quite used to using them yet. But I was planning on doing a after this month is over, so if not next week, then the week after, doing a bit of a review on um, on how this month has gone. You know how the socks um, have turned out, needle preferences, my thoughts on the different needles. Because like I said, I have high high sharps, chai goos, addies both lace and sock rockets, carbons. Um, I pretty much use the whole spectrum of sock needles and I've used them all month, so uh, all this month. So I think I probably have a good idea on what I like and what I don't like about each one. So maybe doing a bit of a review on those. Um, also wanted to talk about gauge in socks. I, I sat down and I measured my sock gauge the other day on the socks that I've been knitting. And I realize that obviously different needles give you different gauges, but the, the way that I adjust my need, my stitch counts, and I hadn't really thought about this beforehand, but I obviously don't knit the same number of stitches on each size needle. But the, um, the differences has meant, the different stitch counts and on the different needles has meant, and the difference in gauge, means that my finished socks are almost always the same size, circumference wise. So that's interesting because I hadn't done that intentionally, but that's, I mean, I had, but I hadn't been measuring my socks to ensure that that happens. I've just been adjusting and trying as I go for the best fit. And it just happens that there's a very specific size that I like for my socks. And it turns out I like quite a bit of negative ease on my socks. I have about a nine inch circumference foot. Um, and that's not, my, that's not at the widest point over the instep. That's, you know, just a bit below the instep. Um, but most of my socks have a gauge, the gauge measurement would give me, is giving me a six and a half inch circumference sock. So I like quite a bit of negative ease with my socks. I don't like them to be baggy. And the reason why I have that much negative ease is because the socks do stretch. Over time, socks stretch. And I don't, um, want to have super baggy socks at the end of the day. Um, so yeah, so get back to my point. So because I want to talk about that either next week or in a couple of weeks, my question to you all this week is, um, what is your, what is, what is your favorite sock gauge? I say, well, what is your sock gauge? What, what, what gauge do your, um, socks come up at on different size needles? Do you use different size needles for socks depending on the yarn or do you have a standard size that you use for all socks, no matter the yarn? Um, no matter the thickness of the fingering weight yarn that you're using. Um, 
you know, what is your sock needle preference? Do you prefer Addies? Do you prefer High Hires? Do you prefer Knit Pro? And this is Pride, whatever. You know, what is your favourite sock needle? What's your favourite sock gauge? Um, what's, uh, what was the other one? How Also, how have your socks worn? I've been thinking about doing a bit of a review on how some of my socks have worn over time. Some of the socks, my early socks, compared to the socks I've knit recently, how they've worn, how they've washed, um, you know, which ones are already felting, which ones are looking great. Um, just sort of give you guys a bit of an idea, because I get a few questions about that as well, here and there on Instagram and stuff, people asking me how my socks are holding up. So I'm interested, how have your socks worn, which has been, which yarn brands or dyers have, um, have you had the best luck with in terms of wear? How hard do you wear your socks? Do you wear your socks in shoes or do you just wear them at home? Do you wear them in boots? Stuff like that. I think that's going to be the general list of questions for this week. I'll, I'll, I'll write out more specific. I mean, this question is quite specifically in the episode thread and in the uh, show notes for you. So it should be a bit clearer than me just rambling now. So moving on to uh other things so in terms of other things i the event the next event i have coming up is the curious handmade country retreat in in march which i'm really looking forward to and then i have and that's it sorry that's that's the only knitting event i have coming up at the moment this year um i am really looking forward to getting back to sewing i have missed sewing and i have a stack of fabric that's all prepped and ready to go for bags that i really want to get working on get the stock shop that get the shop stocked um so that moves on to shop news the shop is closed at the moment like i said there's only one notions pouch in the shop at the moment so i've closed the shop for now um until i get more bags done and i think again i'm going to take a quick break here get myself reorganized and come back for acquisitions. Right, so I'm back again. Right, so last week I showed you some of the things that I got from Vogue Knitting Live and uh, this week I am taking a break from the Vogue Knitting Live stuff <laughs> that I bought and I'm going to talk to you a bit about uh, my trip up to Connecticut which I mentioned last week briefly and I said I would talk more about it this week so that's going to be the focus of my acquisitions and I'll do a bit of a recap of what we got up to when we were there at the same time. So on the morning of the day that I was heading up to Connecticut, I headed, walked over to Grand Central Station, uh, got my ticket and was waiting around for the train and I was uh, messaging with Sarah, who's who's my friend, who I met up at, who I was meeting in Connecticut with her sister Adrian. And uh, so yeah, it was, it was, I was really looking forward to it. And I had a couple of pairs, well, two, three pairs of socks that I was knitting on at the time. And I had plenty to keep me busy on the two hour train journey up there to New Haven, where, like I said, Sarah and her sister Adrian picked me up and, and we headed off. So the first place we hit, went to was Knit New Haven, which is in New Haven, as the name would suggest. It's the, this is the bag of goodies that I got. And I had a very definitive color scheme going coming out of this shop, it seems. Um, everything fits into a very clear colour palette of yellows and teals, but I love it. So, first up, I grabbed these three skeins of Quince & Co in the Chickadee base, which I love Quince & Co Chickadee. I knit a shawl out of Quince & Co Chickadee um, last year and I really like it. Actually, they should probably go like this, so that way up so the tags aren't in the way. So this is the sort of semi-gradient set, as it were, that I got. And yeah, so the colours. So this dark one is, uh, the darkest one is Peacock, which I really love. It's a beautiful, really dark teal verging on sort of with quite a bit of like a green undertone, leaning towards green. Then um, this next one is Aleutian. A L E U T I A N, Illusion. I think that's how you say that, but it's just a lighter version of the peacock. I think they go really well together. And then I also got an egret, which is like a cream white color, like a natural color to go with it. And I think the three together would make a really beautiful three color project. And I haven't quite figured out what yet. 
because there's only 50 grams of each, but 150 grams of sport weight, which is 166 meters per 50 grams or 181 yards is quite a decent amount. So I'm looking forward to coming up with something special with this. And the other two skeins that I picked up from Knit New Haven are these two. I've always wanted to try some Mrs. Crosby yarn. And so this is Mrs. Crosby Loves to Play. This is on her, on the hat box base, which I believe is a sport weight. The argid would indicate such. It is 75% superwash merino, 15% silk and 10% cashmere. And it's 317 yards in 100 grams. So yeah, really, really love these colors. Greens and blues and these sort of golden yellows. Really, really like that. And then I also picked up this skein to go with it, which, I'm oh, sorry, I forgot to mention, this one is called Northern Perula, is the colorway, Northern Perula. And I picked up this skein of Shibui, of Shibui yarns. This is their staccato base. It's 70% superwash merino, 30% silk, 175 meters in 50 grams. So similar yardage, um, 100 grams to the Mrs. Crosby. Uh, it's technically a fingering weight, but when you look at the two yarns together, they look pretty much the same, thickness-wise. Um, let me get a strand of that on my finger. You know, the the Shibui doesn't look that much finer than the Mrs. Crosby yarn. They look about the same to me, to be honest. So, and I really love how the, a really obvious choice would have been gone to go for like a green or a blue to pick out from this, but the yellow is much um, doesn't isn't as there isn't as much of the yellow in the Mrs. Crosby yarn, which is why I think going bringing out the yellow with the uh, Shibui really works in this case. And I'm really looking forward to coming up with a shawl for that. So that's what I picked up at Knit New Haven. And I was looking actually at the needles that they had in stock there um, to see to see if they had any more high highs because I hadn't picked up any more at that point. Um, I did actually in the end pick up some from Burgundy Live, which I showed you last week. But I had been, look I'd been keeping an eye out for them. And they did have high highs, but they didn't have the sharps. And I was asking them about it. And um, they said they don't stock the sharps, they only stock the regular high highs because they figured that those were sharp enough and that people kept injuring themselves with the sharps. So they didn't think it was worth stocking them. And I was like, oh, okay. I don't hurt myself with the sharps. I don't poke holes in my fingers because I don't, I don't knit that way. I've kind of trained myself not to poke my needles with my fingers to avoid hurting myself. Um, so I rarely use the tip of my thumb or the tip of my finger to push my needle down. I do occasionally. It happens more so on the very first row after I've cast on because that's usually quite, it is usually the tightest row of knitting for me. So, um, so yeah, but so I didn't stock it for that reason, which I thought was quite funny. But we spent quite a bit of time in Knit New Haven and it's a really, really quite a small shop, but it was very sweet and very nicely laid out. Then we headed to the, to the yarn basket, which is the next shop we, we headed to and that was in Branford, Connecticut and it was more it was more commercial it was actually probably all commercial dyed yarn in the in the yarn basket but it was a really big store really big yarn shop a very good selection very good variety a lot of Barocco, Cascade, Plymouth yarns you know all the really big commercial brands that you know of but they also had a very good variety of those brands, which I thought was quite good. And the people who worked there were really, really lovely. Um, I think the main guy who worked there, the manager or something, he was really helpful, really chatty, really lovely to, to talk to. And I did pick up a few things from there as well. Surprisingly, all sock yarn. <laughs> or maybe not surprisingly. I thought I'd try my hand at some Barocco socks, because I've never tried Barocco so for socks before. I've heard quite a bit about it. And so I picked up this skein, and this may potentially be socks for my dad or my brother or some other male family member or friend or someone. But I really like the colours and I thought they make good man socks. Um, and this is 75% superwash wool, 25% nylon. Quite rough, 
ish you know it's 406 meters and 100 grams it feels like a reggia or an opal kind of standard sock yarn feeling then i picked up these two skeins of Servinia in the forever Servinia forever i'm not sure it's made in italy and it's color number 46 i believe if i'm not mistaken and i didn't realize this at the time i remember picking up this skein going, this looks like a very familiar yarn to me. Like I've not seen this brand anywhere, but this seems, seems really, really familiar. Then I watched an episode of um, the Holland Handmade podcast, but with Erin, and she's knitting a pair of socks out of this exact yarn. I'm like, that's where I know it from. I've seen Erin knitting with it. So, um, so yeah, so she's knitting a pair of socks for her daughter, I believe out of, I think it's even the same colorway. Um, of this yarn so it's interesting to see how it knits up and i'm looking forward to casting these on too and they these will probably also be for gifts um gift socks and then the last thing that i picked up is a skein of plymouth uh, plymouth yarn happy feet 100 splash it's 90 percent superwash merino 10 percent nylon there's beautiful green and purple speckles which of course, if it's got green and purple and it's speckles, I have to buy it because it's, it's my colours. And actually, we all picked up a skein of this, um, myself, Adrian and Sarah. So we're going to have matching socks, which I think is going to be quite fun. And it's really nice, really squishy, really soft. Um, it's got quite a high twist. And I've heard quite a bit about Plymouth Happy Feet for, for socks. So I'm looking forward to trying these out. And that's what I got from the yarn basket. I'll pop those back into the bags, get that out of the way. And then we went on to uh, Madison Wall in Madison, I say, I see Madison, Connecticut. And this store, again, really tiny, really, really tiny shop, but there's literally yarn and fibre everywhere. Hanging from the ceilings, yarn and fibre dangling around everywhere. It was beautiful. And we went into the back room uh, I think Sarah was uh, Sarah's a spinner as well, and I'll get to that later. But uh, Sarah's asking the woman, I think she owns the shop, um, she was asking her if they had any like fleeces or something, and she was like, yeah, yeah. We took us into this back room, which I guess is where they host cl have classes, maybe. And it was like five different spinning wheels, like stacks and stacks of fiber all over the place it was it was a dream it was it was a spinner's dream <laughs> i'm not a spinner and even i thought it was fascinating and um yeah so everywhere you look there's like baskets of different yarns there's loads of hand spun for sale there's art yarns and all sorts there was so much there it was actually quite overwhelming at one point it was hard to decide if there was anything i wanted to get and one thing i've been a bit conscious about on this trip was that I don't have a lot of heavier weight yarns in my stash. I don't have a lot of heavy, heavier weight yarns for things like, you know, slightly chunkier hats or cowls and stuff, especially things that'd be good for gift knitting for people who live in colder climates than I do. So I ended up just getting one skinny yarn from Madison Wool in the end. And what I picked up was this beautiful red, um, chunky, I think it's chunky, is it bulky? bulky bulky two ply yarn and the name of this i have to admit that the name of the company was um was definitely a factor in purchasing this yarn and the company is called rhino fluff because when your yarn is named rhino fluff of course you have to buy it <laughs> and well that was my justification anyway and the colorway is garnet this beautiful red and the bulky two ply, 128 yards, 117 meters, and 100 grams, and it's 100% Peruvian Highland wool. It's non superwash, so it's hand wash only. So probably not the most appropriate for gift knitting, but I will probably keep this for myself as a as a big chunky hat. I may even stick a couple of cables in it because it looks like it'd be a fun cable hat. Out of rhino fluff, <laughs> I just love that name. And the other thing I picked up from Madison Wool was well, something I've seen floating around, I say floating around, I've seen walking around different yarn shops, either in New York and actually even in Iceland, I saw it and I saw it in London and I kept walking past it going, no, I don't need one. No, I don't need one. I needed one. I got a jumbo pom-pom maker because if I'm going to make a big chunky hat, I need to have a big chunky pom-pom to go on top of it. 
and whoops sorry <laughs> I'm so sorry if that was really loud um yeah I'm really looking forward to making a big chunky pom-pom out of that so yes that pretty much covers everything I bought in Connecticut which was a decent amount of yarn way more than I had actually anticipated uh, for one day <laughs> out and about but I'm really happy with everything I got everything was very uh, intentional purchasing as it were I may have not had a specific patterns in mind when I bought the Mrs Crosby or the Quince & Co but I knew they're going to be shawls or um, more likely most likely designs so I'm really looking forward to working with those and I love the yarns and the bulky was very specific again for a hat and the others are sock yarn, so they'll be socks. So I think I did okay. I didn't, there was nothing there that I'm like, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do with that kind of thing. I know what I'm doing with all of it, so it's good. Happy with that. But that wasn't all I got in Connecticut that day. Um, Sarah and I, I contacted Sarah actually before I left Bahrain to see if she'd be interested in doing another swap. We did a swap last time I met up with her in September, and she gifted, like I said, she's a spinner. And so she gifted me some handspun and, and we swapped and stuff. And this time I was like, I was sewing up some bags before we left. And I, I was sewing up this one print and I was like, oh, I know Sarah's going to love this print. And I had the perfect yarn to match with it. And I, so I messaged her, I was like, Sarah, would you be interested in trading some yarn and a project bag for some of your handspun? She was like, yeah, of course, sure. Because I love knitting with her handspun and I knit a hat out of the handspun she gave me last time. So I was like, great, let's, let's trade. So I was expecting, you know, one, possibly two skeins of handspun in exchange for the bag and yarn that I gave her. But no, Sarah really spoiled me. She gave me a lot of things. Uh, so I'll start with the other things actually, and then I'll save the handspun for last. So one thing she gave me was this really cute box with uh, the M embroidered on it, which she did herself as cross stitch, I think. Um, I'm not very good, yes, but it's, she's cross stitched the M on it in purple, because that's my colour. I love it, and this is going to be great for holding little bits and pieces I have floating around my desk, because I always have too much in terms of little bits and pieces floating around my desk. Then she also got me this really adorable magnetic notebook notepad thing which is going to be really handy and I'll stick that on the fridge for writing shopping lists. Then her sister Adrian actually got me something as well which I thought was awesome. She made me this uh, little duct tape wallet which is just really fun because it's rainbows and purple and I love it. It's it's ridiculously fun. Um, I'm looking forward to getting to use that now as well. It'd be great for traveling to be honest. Um, Right, so onto the hand spun, my favourite part of this whole thing. Um, let me just get this out of the wrapping so it doesn't rustle around so much. Okay, so first things first is fibre from hand, Fat Cat Knits, hand painted fibre and yarns. This is the Day's End Drifter colourway, I believe. Sh and Sarah managed to get, this is so, it's 80% superwash merino, 20% nylon sparkle combed top. And Sarah managed to get 292 yards of a DK weight out of it. Look how crazy sparkly this yarn is. I don't know if it's showing up on camera or not, but it is super sparkly in real life. And Sarah almost always chain plies her yarn. She's not a fan of barber polling, which I actually really like in handspun, but Sarah does not like barber polling, so almost all her yarns are chain plied. But I think that is really cool. Really like how this has turned out, really beautiful. Like I said, Sarah knows my colours. She did really well on that one. So I'm really looking forward to knitting up something out of this. I'm not sure, it's not, I wouldn't say it's next to Skin Soft, so maybe, maybe some DK weight mittens. I know there's a pattern I've got in mind for that potentially so maybe then Sarah also gave me this beautiful skein purple and green because what else would she give me other than purple and green and this is uh Wensleydale uh fiber Wensleydale uh fiber it's a fingering weight it was a full four ounces and she was saying she's not entirely sure how this happened but it's only 224 yards out of 100 grams out of over 100 grams and it feels heavy 
it feels like a very dense skein of yarn. So I don't know what it is about the Wensleydale, but it's made for a very, it's clearly got a lot of drape, as you can see, and it's very drapey, but it's also a very heavy skein. So it'd be interesting to see how this knits up and what it will turn into. It's definitely not next to skin soft, it's definitely rustic. Um, yeah, I'm pretty sure I wouldn't want this right next to my skin. But, so I'm not entirely sure what this will be, but it will be something beautiful, no less. And this is by Classy Squid Fibre Company. The details there. And the other hand sponge she gave me is also by the Classy, Classy Squid Fibre Company. It is, um, I think it's called Inspired, the colorway. And it's BFL, Tessa Silk, Firestar and Angelina. This is also for ingrained weight, um, but it was only a 50 gram uh, bag of fibre. I'm not actually sure how what the prep was on it, but look at that. Isn't that awesome? It's a, it's a gradient. It's a gradient. And it's almost rainbow colours. And it is beautiful and I love it. And this will be something really special. Again, I'm not entirely sure. I'm quite tempted to just make a really big slouchy sock head hat out of this. Because it's, it's enough to make a sock head hat. Maybe not super slouchy, but it's 50 grams. And my last sock, sock head hat that I made was out of 50 grams. And it worked out fine. So I'm thinking maybe something like that would be quite fun. Um, yeah. So we will see. I think that would be really fun. So... Right, I think I've rambled on enough <laughs> with the acquisitions and so Sarah was super generous with all the hand spun and like I said, I love knitting with hand spun. One day I would really love to knit a pair of socks out of hand spun. So if there's anyone out there who wants to trade some hand spun yarn that would be good for socks for project bags, hit me up. I'd be totally down for that. Um, yeah, just putting that out there. <laughs> right, so let's move on to the week in review. Um, keeping it short this week, I don't actually have a lot, a lot to share with you. Uh, the boys have been actually hysterical this week. They've not been around this morning to pick up and show you. Hugo was in earlier when I was first filming, but he's kind of toddled off now. Um, we had one morning, in the mornings Derek tends to jump onto the bed and come start demanding for food or being quite snuggly and whatever. So one morning I woke up quite early and Derek jumped onto the bed on my side and kind of got cozy and snuggly and so I was, I was just giving him some strokes on his head and then and then he rolled over and next thing I know he's rolled right off the bed he, so he's purring away and then suddenly he rolls over and what I hear is a thud as he hits the floor he was not best pleased <laughs> and he jumped back onto the bed and this time he came and slept between me and Perry so he was safe so that was quite funny it made me laugh a little bit um and then Hugo has developed a new habit uh a new hobby shall we say and he's always done this though he's always loved to chew on boxes and we always find bits of boxes all over the place and it's why we have so many boxes around the around the house when we said apartment there around the house but he's decided now that ripping up boxes at 4 a.m and then deciding and then trying to push them and successfully pushing them down the stairs is his new favorite thing to do Perry is less than impressed I tend to sleep through it most of the time but Perry's a lighter sleeper than I am so it wakes him up and it makes him incredibly grumpy. <laughs> but um, anyway. Oh, and I posted a picture to Instagram the other day. This was the box that Amber, who's yarn hoarder on um, Instagram, sent me my goodies last week that I showed you. And this is this is not a kitten-sized box. This is not a cat-sized box. This is very much a small box. And Hugo decided he was very adamant that this was going to be his box. Took him some time, but he eventually managed to get into this box and he had his fluff like all hanging over the edges and it was it was a sight to see. So if you haven't seen that picture, go check it out on Instagram. It's on there, it's quite funny. And uh yeah, I've I've mentioned it a few times. Hugo is a lover of lettuce, he loves salad. Every time I pull the lettuce out of the fridge, even before I've opened the packet or started cutting it up or anything, he comes running into the kitchen and starts meowing and circling my feet to be given some lettuce. It's a very strange cat. So the other day we were having salad with our dinner and he was always really insistent to try and have some when I do that. So I thought to keep him off our backs and to let us enjoy our dinner, I I made him a plate of salad. <laughs> and there's, there's also a video of that on Instagram if you want to see, it's quite, quite funny. Um, 
so yeah, and the only other thing I was going to talk about, it's not the only other thing, but one other thing I was going to mention was, so last week I talked about the US legislation that restricts travel for dual citizens, um, people like me who have dual nationality with Iran and a European country um, to the US on an ESTA and those who are who have European nationality and have traveled to Iran the last five years um, apparently can no longer travel to the US on an ESTA visa, the visa waiver program and have to get full visas. So that was quite, not so much stressful, but it was worrying for me. Um, Partially because I, as you guys probably know, I do go to, I have been going to the US quite regularly recently and I didn't have any troubles on this last trip, but two days after I found out about it, so it was a day after I podcasted, my mum was traveling to the US. She was going to Atlanta to visit her brother who lives there. And uh, I was really worried that she was going to have trouble because we just heard about this. She had an Esther. She had no other visas to go to the US. She only had a, the Esther. And, and yeah, so I was quite worried that something was going to go wrong, that she wasn't going to be able to go, they weren't going to let her on the plane. And my mum was born in Tehran, so in her passport it says place of birth is Tehran, so it's incredibly obvious that she's Iranian. Um, whereas for me, I was born in London, so when you first look at my passport, it's not all that clear. Um, but anyway, she was okay. I told my brother and my dad about it, and I didn't actually send the article to my mum initially because I didn't want to worry her unnecessarily in case it, there was nothing, to, in case it would be fine. Uh, my brother said they did have a bit of a, they did have a moment of panic when they couldn't, when she couldn't check in online in the morning of her flight. And so they all went to the airport together and it was fine. My mum got on the plane, she got to Atlanta, she's there now, she's having a great time. And um, so yeah, I'm not entirely sure how this legislation is being enforced, how stringent they're going to, I don't really understand it now because my mum's managed to go and this was after it came into effect so I guess we'll see how things play out over time uh like I said I don't have any immediate plans of going back to the US I probably probably won't be going back to the US for at least a few months um probably the earliest it will be will be around September time at the earliest because I've got too many things happening between now and then that means I probably won't be going but we'll see Things can change. They always do <laughs> when you least expect it. Um, oh, and that random postal story that I told you about last week with that guy from Bahrain whose mum ended up with my one of my packages, amongst a few other things. So she returned the package to the post office to Royal Mail in the UK, and they finally delivered it to the right address. And the recipient has received their bag, and I am so relieved because I was, I was so concerned. It was the only bag that had gone missing from that batch of orders, and I was just anyway. I'm glad she got it. And, and yeah, and then I think it was a couple nights ago, I saw on Instagram that Amber, again, yarn holder, uh, she'd posted that she'd made these felted slippers for her husband and that her children then wanted some. And I thought it was quite a funny post. So I was showing it to my husband and he was like, oh, what are, you know, what is felting? What does that mean? So I was explaining the process to him and how it works. And I've never felted anything before either. Um, just, let me just put it out there. So my knowledge of felting is relatively limited to what I've read and seen online. Um, so I was giving him the vague idea of how it works and why it's good for slippers and stuff like that. And he sort of looked at me and was like, if you want, you can make me slippers. <laughs> I was like, really? You, you want slippers? <laughs> he was like, I don't mind. I could have, I could, I'd wear slippers. I'm like, okay, you've never worn slippers. In the six years that I've known you, you have never worn slippers. So I'd never assumed you would want slippers. Um, so now he wants felted slippers. But thank you for that, Amber. And it comes at a time right after I spent a bunch of money on yarn on this recent trip. And then he tells me he wants felted slippers. I don't have any felt wool, feltable wool in my stash for slippers. So um, I am now going to have to buy more yarn. <laughs> Although in fairness, I probably won't be buying any yarn anytime soon. Um, he doesn't want them immediately. He's like, there's no rush for them. It was, you know, we're we're probably past the coldest it's going to get in Bahrain. It's already starting to warm up a bit. It's not as cold as it was a couple of weeks ago. And um, you know, so as long as, you know, maybe for next next winter. So I might do them for his birthday. So I won't be buying yarn anytime soon. <laughs> but at the same time, I just thought the timing was rather funny on that one. Um, and like I mentioned, Perry's in Riyadh today and tomorrow. So he's not coming home tonight. 
which means I'll get to knit late, which is awesome <laughs> for me. Uh, I normally I normally don't knit that late into the evening. I only knit until about 10 p.m. maybe. Um, I could go for longer, but I go to bed when Perry goes to bed. Um, I don't know if I've talked about this before on the podcast because Perry gets up and goes to work every day. And like I mentioned earlier, he's quite a light sleeper. So if I don't sleep when he sleeps, then our sleep schedules get out of sync and it, it can get very annoying. So I've trained myself. When he goes to bed, I go to bed. When he wakes up, I wake up. Um, that way we keep on the same schedule. I'm naturally very much a night owl and he's very much not. So <laughs> um, I do try and keep in sync with him. That way it makes our lives easier. And on that note, I think I am going to say goodbye now. Thank you so much for joining me this week. It's been a pleasure chatting with you. And I hope you all have a very lovely knitting, a week of knitting and crafting and all other fun things. So until next time, take care. Bye.